Thanks everybody for coming. As you know, at the Castellani, we can have coffee before the event. You don't have to wait till after. So feel, please feel free to get up and get yourself uh, replenished back there. There's water, coffee, sweets. Um, welcome to our panel, uh, The Spirituality of Niagara Falls. I have uh, a little bit of deja vu looking into the audience. Uh, this panel is as a result of a zeitgeist we find ourselves in the midst of again is part of our ongoing study and a particular kind of spirit swirling around the university and the museum and the community over the past few years regarding this river we find ourselves beside. We are also here as part of Niagara University's annual Heritage Week during which we take the time to celebrate and explore what it means to be a Catholic in Vincentian University. And we at the planning committee, who I thank the planning committee, um, along with the uh, Castellani Museum for hosting and also Campus Ministry, uh, Mike Jeswald, and I know I'm forgetting people. Um, well, we had, when we were planning this week, um, we all agreed that we would start Heritage Week with our own particular history as a university with this simple question, how did we get here? And why are we here in this particular geographical place rather than somewhere else? like New York or Chicago? This is a more complex question, and so I got together the best people I knew who could help us in this ongoing quest to explore the long and varied history of the Niagara River as a place of spiritual and artistic significance. So I think it's at this point that I should introduce our panel. Um, Dr. Paula Cott is our resident expert on 19th century American letters and literati. And she will talk about Nathaniel Hawthorne's pilgrimage to the falls. Dr. Jamie Carr is also from our English department. She just wrote a literary history of the falls, soon to be published. And she will explore more of what the river means to writers closer to our own time. Um, we will then invite Dr. Bill Cliff of our biology department, who will frame, I think, um, one of the most urgent questions that we can ask today, which is why value the Niagara River? And finally, we are privileged to have the artist Thomas Kegler on campus to share his thoughts on recreating the falls and the river on his canvases. As many of you know, Tom Kegler is a rare example of a Hudson River School artist in his technique, certainly, but also in his quest to show us God's work in nature. And me, my name is Amelia Gallagher, and I teach in the Religious Studies Department. And I wanted to start off today by discussing the spiritual meaning given to the Niagara River by our founder. There's a picture of him, um, John Joseph Lynch. If you got the invitation, the postcard that Mary Helen sent out, you see him there. And this photo of Lynch was taken after he had become the Archbishop of Toronto. And I would like us to draw our attention to him today because while most people from this area are quite familiar with the numerous artists, writers, painters, romantics mainly, who sought spiritual insight by the contemplation of the Niagara River, we're less likely aware of the Vincentian connection to the river, beyond the geographical reality that this is the only Vincentian university located on the Niagara River. I was certainly not aware of this deeper meaning the river connect, how the river was connected to our founding, but there is a connection. John Joseph Lynch, born in Ireland, educated and ordained as a Vincentian priest in France, is credited with the establishment of the university in 1856. Of course, it was established originally as a seminary, Our Lady of the Angels. And it was still a modest seminary when Lynch left in 1860 to go on to become the bishop and then the archbishop of Toronto, which is where he stayed until his death in 1888. Now, there are a few, more than two, I think, dissertations in the basements of Canadian libraries that are written exclusively about Lynch, and, but that is not because he was the founder of Niagara University. That is because of his role in Toronto history. Toronto at that time in the 19th century was like gangs of New York, except it was Toronto, and Lynch was right there in the center of it. You get the impression that he enjoyed being in the thick of the controversies of his day, immigration, um, the threat, as he saw it, of prohibition, the conf conflicts between Protestants and Catholics dragged over to the New World, and this sometimes erupted in street violence and riots. That was why Toronto was known as the Belfast of North America. Now, aside from all this political history, it was during Lynch's long career in Toronto that he reflected in writing on the meaning of Niagara Falls to him 
and by extension to us. He laid out an extraordinary vision of the falls as a place of pilgrimage. Now, I haven't quite worked out the precise timeline of his development of these ideas, but they were put into writing well after the few short years he actually spent here. They come down to us mainly in the form of a pastoral letter, that is an official letter um, intended for his flock. Elsewhere, he also claims a fascination with the falls since his childhood in Europe. Once he got here, the falls and the river became the center of a theology and practical program of pilgrimage. To this end, he founded a shrine for pilgrims who would flock here, which still stands overlooking the Canadian falls where the Carmelite, the large Carmelite monastery is. He then persuaded the Pope to officially recognize the shrine as a pilgrimage site in 1861. For Lynch, this spot overlooking the falls was to be a place of penitence and purification, and in this regard, I think he was deeply influenced by contemporary pilgrimage sites in Europe. Lourdes in France and St. Patrick's Purgatory in Ireland. This influence of what a pilgrimage ought to accomplish is to be expected, I think. And Lynch can be placed in a direct line of Catholic clergy, beginning with Father Hennepin, who were also captivated by the river and its religious meaning. However, Lynch was certainly the one who gave, it, gave the falls the most theological attention. Well, what is more surprising, I think, is the ideas Lynch had of the falls that were clearly borrowed from the Romantics, the Hudson River School, that is, in the way he saw God revealed in natural ph phenomena. You can observe this influence by the language that he used. Uh, through visiting the falls, the pilgrim would be taught sublime lessons. These are Lynch's words about the finitude of life. He referred to the mist of the falls as incense, and as the falls themselves as nature's high altar and so on. Regarding another layer of meaning Lynch imbued upon the falls, the pilgrimage shrine itself was there, which I mentioned was established in 1861, the first year of the American Civil War, and its official title is Our Lady of Peace Shrine. Years later, many years later, again in his later reflections, Lynch stated that with the tremendous loss of life during that war, along with um, the c contemplation of Niagara Falls, this would lead one to reflect on one's own death and to prepare for it. Now there's no way he could have known the extent of life that was to be lost in the Civil War, many of our students among them, among the casualties, but he was certainly aware of death. Of, he was born in Ireland during the cyclical famines, and preparing for death in the 19th century somehow seemed more urgent than it does today, although, of course, no less inevitable. So what do the musings about the river coming from our 19th century founder mean for us? Decades after the founding of this institution as a cemetery, a seminary, pardon, in 1856, Lynch stated that this, our place on this river, was chosen by God so that he may be glorified. With such a clear connection between this institution and its surrounding geography claimed by our founder, I think we have a responsibility to explore what this notion meant to Lynch and even to regard it as an inheritance. And I know what, that we're doing well to revisit the spiritual significance given to the river many centuries, uh, over many centuries as we're doing today. So I'm going to call, well, I'd like to linger in the 19th century and I would like to call up to, up to the podium, Paula Cott. Thank you. Hello. I will focus my talk today on Nathaniel Hawthorne's visit to Niagara, but I begin with Arthur Lumley's Niagara Scene with Different Eyes, published in Harper's Weekly in 1873, because it captures in one image how 19th century Americans, including Hawthorne and his contemporary Thomas Cole, viewed Niagara Falls, viewed American scenery in general, and viewed America as a nation. Lumley's engraving documents the debate about how to observe nature. You can see how Lumley places several figures at the falls. Each figure gazes at the falls through a particular lens, starting from the left and moving counterclockwise, gazing with the eye of the tourist or the eye of the practical businessman who runs mills or the eye of the poet, the geologist, the artist, the soldier and sailor. 
Lumley in this way captures competing views of the falls. Each spectator presumably sees something different in the falls. Lumley also conveys the notion that the eyes through which these viewers gaze restrict their views. They only see one narrow aspect of the falls. He expresses this notion most explicitly with the figure of the soldier who gazes through a telescope, or the sailor who has brought his spyglass, or the geologist who is so intent on gathering rock specimens that he is turned away from the falls altogether. But Lumley privileges the figure who stands at the center and achieves a spiritual relationship with the falls that escapes the other viewers, who achieves a full comprehension of the falls. With the figure he calls the Indian, Lumley breaks the pattern of the repetition of with the eye of and instead records the Indian appeals to the great spirit. With arms outstretched and with the feathers of his headdress mirroring the feathery fall of the water, the American Indian seems to merge with the falls. While others see the site as a source of poetic or artistic inspiration or in scientific knowledge or the water power needed to run mills, the Indian recognizes that this is a sacred site a place of worship. Two other figures require our attention. In the foreground, to the left of the Indian, John Bull, the personification of Old England, stands with Uncle Sam, who, with the eye of patriotism, proudly gestures toward the falls. Niagara is interwoven into the identity of the United States, a young nation intent on demonstrating its value to the world. Some 40 years earlier, in the 1830s, the role played by Uncle Sam in Lumley's piece was played by writers such as Nathaniel Hawthorne and artists such as Thomas Cole. Hawthorne's experience at Niagara Falls in the summer of 1832, three years before the publication of My Visit to Niagara, was one stop of a sightseeing trip through New England and Western New York. Hawthorne had described the motive for this trip in a letter he wrote to his college friend. Hawthorne writes that he makes this journey to gather material which will enable him to acquire an immense literary reputation. We think of Hawthorne as an established writer with an immense literary reputation, but when Hawthorne visited the falls in the 1830s, he was struggling to find a publisher and an audience for his writing. We also tend to think of American literature as an established fact, but at this point in our nation's history, the country is relatively young, and Americans have a collective chip on their shoulders that our nation lacks the established literary tradition of England and the old world in general. In another sketch written in this period, Hawthorne describes American literature as in its infancy, and this was a common perception. For Hawthorne to visit Niagara Falls and write about this experience was part of a patriotic movement to build the reputation of America in Americans' eyes and in the world's eyes. Hawthorne would have seen many tourists on this excursion, but he's careful to include in his sketch that he arrives at the falls in a stagecoach with a visitor from France. Later in the sketch, he describes a, fa a family from Old England. In Hawthorne's time, these European tourists have braved the long sail across the Atlantic to visit this already famous site. The wonder of Niagara Falls, like the fledgling authors writing about it, was helping to put America on the map. If our nation lacked the established literary tradition of the old world, its scenery also was said to lack the historical and cultural associations that characterize the old world and that were believed to make landscape interesting and beautiful. A contemporary of Hawthorne, Hudson River School artist Thomas Cole, addresses this perceived deficiency in his 1836 essay on American scenery. Cole tries to rescue the landscape from the utilitarianism that had kept Americans from appreciating the treasures of their own country. He endorses instead a spiritual relationship with nature that would later influence Lumley's portrayal of the Indian and our own experience of the falls today. Cole writes that in the wildness of American scenery, including its wa waterfalls, one confronts the undefiled works of God and the mind is cast into the, into the contemplation of eternal things. In viewing the wildness of Niagara, one feels a religious tone steal through the mind. When Nathaniel Hawthorne visited Niagara Falls in the summer of 1832, he expected a religious experience and even thought of himself as a pilgrim. Hawthorne begins the sketch by exclaiming that never did a pilgrim approach Niagara Falls with deeper enthusiasm than mine. 
But Hawthorne soon learns that calling oneself a pilgrim and actually experiencing the spirituality of Niagara Falls are very different things. His sketch records his struggle to negotiate the competing views of the falls and provides a literary analog to Lumley's engraving. Like Lumley's repetition of with the eyes of, Hawthorne captures the diversity of views in his sketch as he views others viewing the falls. Hawthorne describes an American tourist as he pulls out a travel guide and labors to adjust his view of the falls to what he has just read in the guide. As Hawthorne points out, this gentleman leaves without one new idea or sensation of his own. Hawthorne describes an artist who is sketching the falls and wants to adjust the falls in accordance with his desire for symmetry, the literal falls. Hawthorne jokes that when he later speaks with the artist, the artist explains that he approves of the falls in general, but thinks that Good Island should have been moved farther to the right so as to widen the American falls and shrink those of the horseshoe. Hawthorne describes two businessmen from Michigan as they declare that, upon the whole, Niagara Falls is worth looking at, applauding it for its immense water power, but adding that they would travel twice as far to see the locks at Lockport, since the locks facilitate commerce. Like Lumley's figures, Hawthorne's tourist, artist, and businessmen view the falls through narrow lenses that fail to capture the true value. As Hawthorne views the falls through these distorting lenses, he struggles to maintain his understanding of the falls as a spiritual sight. He longs to be like the wanderers of old, who gazed upon the falls with the freshness of native feeling. He longs to achieve a relationship to the falls like the one Lumley later portrays through the Indian. Here's Hawthorne. Oh, that I had never heard of Niagara till I beheld it, Hawthorne writes. Blessed were the wanderers of old who heard its deep roar sounding through the woods as the summons to an unknown wander and approached its awful brink in all the freshness of native feeling. Had its own mysterious voice been the first to warn me of its existence, then indeed I might have knelt down and worshipped. What rescues Hawthorne is a young fellow whose homespun cotton dress, staff, and pack over his shoulders identify him as a pilgrim. This fellow advances close to the edge of the falls and fixes his attention on the water. Hawthorne writes, his whole soul seemed to go forth and be transported thither till the staff slipped from his rela relaxed grasp. Achieving his goal, he can relinquish the staff that is associated with his identity as a pilgrim. What does the pilgrim see that tourist, artists, and businessmen are blind to? That here at Niagara, nature is sacred. I conclude with two 19th century paintings of the falls, both on display in the front gallery of the cam, and a 21st century photograph to demonstrate a pattern. 19th century writers and artists such as Hawthorne, Cole, and Lumley shaped how Americans came to see the spiritual nature of the falls, and this spirituality was experienced in similar ways. Recall the outstretched arms of Lumley's Indian, or of Hawthorne's pilgrim. Recall Hawthorne's writing that he longs to kneel and worship at this, at this site. Can you see the outstretched arms, um, the, the boulders, uh, the figures standing like this, the fellow on his knees? Yeah. Yes, this was before the installation of safety reels, but um, <laughs> this posture also conveys the notion of, of worship. In this second painting, you can see a man at the brink of the falls with the plume of spray highlighting his outstretched arms. And finally, a photograph by a member of the NU community, Evan Fleming Pierce, who's actually in the audience, entitled Feel the Power, that tells us that visitors today continue to experience the spiritual power of Niagara Falls. Thank you. Though it's been written about for centuries, writers are still inspired by the falls. It's probably fair to say that the predominant genres of the past, travel writing, such as Hawthorne's, and poetry, have now given way mostly to fiction. Descriptions of the picturesque, beauty, and the sublime 
have been reshaped into Gothic-style romances and toxic tragedies of modern times. Though the genres may have changed along with the changing um, social and physical environment, the intangible quality of the falls, river, and the rapids across the borders have not. Niagara Falls remains a landscape that can transport us beyond the material aspects of everyday life, an experience that prominent writers continue to express in literature. I've developed a course here at NU that I call Literary Niagara, where I teach other works that would fit well with today's topic, such as regionally inflected slave narratives of the 19th century, or the work of Tuscarora and Onondaga Nation novelist Eric Gansworth, who writes today. But Amelia said, keep it short. <laughs> so I thought I'd discuss what I imagine are possibly lesser known works on the falls. In particular, short stories by contemporary Canadian and American women writers. I'll focus on just three stories today that speak to me um, about the natural power, to the natural power of the falls as a source of symbolic significance. So you probably recognize this writer. A year after she published The Handmaid's Tale in 1985, which is of course now a hit streaming series, the renowned Canadian writer Margaret Atwood contributed a short story to the Toronto Globe and Mail with the specific location of the Whirlpool Rapids. Like The Handmaid's Tale, an allegory of confinement with its state repression of women, the Whirlpool Rapids also explores the relation of gender to place here in Niagara Falls. The story is a parable, one woman's figurative rebirth into a state of fearlessness. And there are likely multiple ways um, to read the water imagery in each of these stories. I'll just offer um, kind of my perspective. Emma, the story means character in both the Whirlpool Rapids and um, a partner story called Walking on Water, attends a local college while working at a Niagara Falls diner when she's invited to test a new floatable technology in the Whirlpool Rapids. Atwood is drawing, actually, on a true event from 1975 when people died during a rafting trial for a tourism company. In the fictional story, Emma seeks adventure, but also a sense of self-worth. And here's a, a passage from the story. She would join the ranks of those who had, in the past, wished to challenge Niagara Falls, the tightrope walkers, and those who'd had themselves bolted into padded barrels and flung into the river above the drop, even the suicides. In all of these attempts, it seemed to Emma there was an element of religious trial, walking barefoot over the coals, ordeal by water. All of these people were flinging themselves on the mercy of something or other, certainly not just a river. Save me, Lord. Show me I'm important enough to deserve it. When the raft capsizes, a new Emma emerges, one unafraid of the dangers of the world. The experience gives her a strength she didn't know she had. Emma's miraculous survival makes her fearless, but it is a characteristic later met with a current of social scrutiny, as others are uncomfortable with her expression of invulnerability. What I find intriguing here are the ways the falls seem to call to something within, not just a desire to overcome or conquer nature, but a search for greater meaning and self-worth. The thematic concern with vulnerability is expressed in this next story, Abel Baker, Charlie Dog. Um, it, uh, written in 1978 and here published in the New Yorker originally by Stephanie Vaughn, who is now a Cornell University professor. Like Atwood's paired Emma stories, Vaughn has two short, stor short stories set along the Niagara River, primarily at Fort Niagara in the early years of the Cold War. The stories are narrated by 12-year-old Gemma. The other story is, um, is called Dog Heaven, and it's this really beautiful story. Um, written in 1989, also um, first published in, in The New Yorker. But I'll just speak today on Abel Baker, Charlie Dog. In this earlier story, the falls and the Niagara River, with their complex history and strong undercurrents, are a place of family tension. I don't like the river, Gemma's mother says. I think it wants to hypnotize you. For her father, the river is a place of challenge and later escape. It calls to him, and I'll come back to that point in a moment. For Gemma, the river is a place of mystery, of loss, and return. And here's her quote. The river fascinated me. I often stood between the yellow curtains of my bedroom and looked down upon it and thought about how deep and swift it was, how black under the glittering surface. 
The newspaper carried stories about people who jumped over the falls, 14 miles upriver from our house. I thought of their bodies, pushed along the soft silt of the bottom, tumbling silently, huddled in upon themselves like fetuses. They floated invisibly past my bedroom window, out into the lake. Later, as an adult, after her father dies, the river is a place of longing and memory, of the distance between father and daughter, of the borders between people. Gemma tries to reconcile loving memories of her father with, a mo with moments of crisis, the shameful end to his military career and his subsequent threat to her mother during a moment of drunken anger. Unable to cope, he walks out into the ice of the Niagara River as Gemma watches, unable to reach him emotionally. I wept, she later narrates, because when I was 12 years old, I had stood on a snowy river bank as he became a shadow on the ice and further to see he would slip between the cracking flows into the water. Both Gemma and her father return, uh, turned to the natural world in their moments of emotional crisis in a search for understanding and meaning. They turned particularly to that powerful river just beyond us, which both gives and takes life. The last story I'd like to talk about is also the most recent. Is, is also the most recent. It's by British Columbia writer Laura Trunkey and appears in her 2016 uh, short fiction collection called Double Dutch. Hands Like Birds is the story of 13-year-old narrator Karen learning to live with Usher syndrome, which is causing her to go deaf and blind. She's on a trip with her father and aide with the full knowledge that Niagara Falls is the last landscape she'll ever see. As such, I think the story calls into question theories of the sublime, that overwhelming, uh, that overpowering experience of awe and terror that early writers to the falls often described, the qualities dependent on the very senses the main character is losing, sight and hearing. Here's an example of Karen's experience. When we reach the water, Dad crouches to set me on the ground, then takes my hands and places them on the warm railing. This is what the guidebook proclaimed to be the unmatched beauty of the illuminated falls at night. There's a faint red glow, then a yellow one when I shift my head, a green glow when I shift it further, blurriness that must be water, basically nothing. And of course, um, for those of you who are probably familiar, guidebooks um, in the 19th century were you know, written by the dozens, um, and they all kind of proclaimed um, something about this beauty and sublimity. So I think the story is kind of hearkening back to that as well. As Karen navigates the narrowing of her visual and oral world, the real terror for this protagonist is a traumatic memory of assault she endures at school. In her most harrowing moments of confinement by her assailant, Karen imagines herself a pelican soaring above the water like those she had seen near her home at Slave River in the Canadian Northwest Territories. By the end of the story, the falls, um, which she cannot see or hear, but can feel, provide her with a similar moment of transcendence. And this is the final quote. I close my eyes and imagine I'm a pelican, my feathers rippling in the gusts of cool air churned by the waterfall. Birds regularly get swept down the falls, particularly in foggy weather, but even more of them pass right over, coasting on air currents. I stretch out my arms, feel the mist on my pelican wings, then I lift up above it all. And um, I couldn't help but think of the um, images in the corners of the paintings that Paula had pointed to with the outstretched arms here. Karen feels the sublime in the mist and rumble as she teeters on the precipice of the falls, a bird in flight. Each of these stories strike me as about human vulnerability and the search for mercy. Atwood, Vaughn, and Trunkey, but also Alice Munro and Emma Donahue, who also have short stories on the region, perceive more in the landscape than solely the physical. That writers continue to be drawn to the falls suggests its intangible power a spirit of place that still inspires. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome my colleague in biology, Dr. Bill Cliff. The title of my talk is formulated as a question, both to you and to myself. 
because I wish to approach the topic at hand, spirituality of the falls, from the perspective of values. In particular, environmental values, as typically represented by the field of environmental ethics. So after providing some reasons for why we might value the falls, I would like, with your help and time during our discussion, to attempt to build a bridge to the notion of spirituality. Ethicists always speak of two major types of environmental values, and I'll outline them here briefly. Instrumental values, sometimes called usefulness values, reflect a value that is an, a, a means to an end. In other words, it's a utility of, of a particular thing. Whereas intrinsic or final values value something for what it is in itself, its intrinsic worth or value. Now, I'm gonna take these notions and organize the idea of values into major perspectives, or we might call centers or sources for environmental ethics. And so here I've outlined, I'm sorry, Amelia, I've missed some things here. But anyway, I'll, have to, I'll just talk through it, because I missed them. But anyway, I, I missed a slide in here, I apologize. So there are three types of perspectives or sources of environmental values. The first is what we might call ecocentric that is, concerns the ecological or environmental well-being and activity. And therefore, it is looking at values from the perspective of the environment. Secondly, the anthropocentric, or sometimes called homocentric, which concerns human activity and, and well-being, and therefore looks at values from the perspective of humans. And lastly, the theocentric, that is from God's perspective, and it concerns his activity and what he values. So, we're going to be looking at, in that sense, values from th these three different perspectives. Let's begin with ecocentric. And again, a reminder, this is concerning ecological activity or well-being, and it's associated with both the instrumental and intrinsic value, in this case, of the riverway. So let's review some of these that have been identified uh, over, over, the, over time. And I've, I've divided this up into two categories. The first, what we might call critical ecological environmental goods and services. For example, it is recognized that the Niagara River Corridor is a significant migratory bird pathway, globally significant, listed by Audubon. Over 300 species of birds use this corridor at different times, 27 at-risk species, and including four species that are globally significant in terms of their numbers, even in this area. The Niagara River also has some unique habitats. Uh, the, the New York State Natural Heritage Program has defined two of those ecological communities in particular that are of statewide significance. The so-called calcareous cliff and also the talus slope woodland. It might be hard to see this, but if you look over to the right on this diagram, or this picture here of, of the whirlpool, that cliff face would be the calcareous cliff slope or a community, and then the sloping land that's, that's coated with vegetation would be the talus slope. And these have been identified as two major habitats of significance. The Niagara River itself is a significant spawning ground for lake sturgeon, both upstream and downstream of the falls. And then lastly, I think we recognize that the Niagara River is a water source for Lake Ontario. In fact, 83% of the tributary flow to the lake comes from uh, the Niagara River. And for those of us who, who've, who've watched the news at times, we remember a couple years ago the infamous smelly black discharge that occurred at the falls and that caused really a nationwide and worldwide sensation. We also recognize, if, we, if we're not aware of it, there is a significant uh, remediated uh, Superfund site right over here called Hooker High Park, which has also contributed to, sadly, the, uh, the toxicity of the, of the uh, of Lake Ontario. Secondly, in terms of eco ecological ecocentric uh, values, we recognize biodiversity, probably more so as an intrinsic value, but there are a number of rare, threatened, and endangered species that inhabit the Niagara River, and a number of communities uh, that as well are threatened. Furthermore, because of the nature of the gorge and the riverway, and because of the nature of the, the environment that is formed there, um, the state has recognized that the Niagara River Gorge has one of the most diverse assemblages of plants, and in particular, rare plants in New York State, which are protected. Uh, and then lastly, and this, this extends really to the history of the gorge, 
Um, there are cedars that exist within the gorge that uh, botanists have estimated are at least 500 years old, perhaps up to 1,000 years old in terms of their historical uh, uh, time frame. So these are a number of things that we would identify as both intrinsic and, 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 and instrumental values in terms of goods and services and biodiversity that we would look at from the perspective of an ecocentric view. I think we're probably more familiar with the anthropocentric view, that is that concerns human activity and well-being associated with what I might say is the instrumental value of the gorge to human welfare. And this could include its usefulness to Native Americans who first uh, or lived in this area, as well as uh, European settlers that colonized and present inhabitants. And environmental ethicist James Justice has, a, has identified different sources of these instrumental values. And I think we would recognize these uh, in terms of the gorge. Uh, cultural, historical, recreation, entertainment. I had to epitomize this by my friend here, Chris Stenzel, who is a a long time uh, hiker with me in the gorge. We're here on trail number eight, enjoying that recreational uh, side of, of things. But of course, jogging, birding, uh, fishing, thrill seeking are all, all different aspects of entertainment. Economic aspects in terms of instrumental value, whether it's fishing or tourism, you can see the evidence of that over on the Canadian side in this picture, uh, energy as well. Scientific values. Uh, the the gorge itself is a reference section for early Silurian uh, period geology in, we in uh, eastern uh, North America. Psychological well-being is associated with uh, instrumental values in a place like uh, Niagara Falls. Certainly aesthetics. And then finally spiritual, in the sense that already our panelists have, have addressed a number of individuals who, have, who ha would, I would say, associate spiritual value to the river and to the falls. And so in all of these, we would recognize as anthropocentric, that is coming from human utility, human value that we would place on the falls. And then thirdly, what we might call theocentric, and I hope this connects to this idea of spirituality. These are God-centered values. These concern God's activity and his values, his concern for his creation, and I would say his concern for the river, riverway. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. He founded it, it says later on in this psalm. He established it. God is a creator, is the sustainer, and is the possessor of his world of the falls. This verse is often cited as the foundation to a theocentric view of ethics. God is the rightful owner of the earth. And we'll see that this is encapsulated in what is called the Judeo-Christian stewardship ethic with regard to environmental ethics of, of the land. God sees intrinsic and aesthetic value in his creation. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. This scene that we see here is not just a mere perception. It is a looking into, it is an inspecting, it is a considering, it is a thoughtfulness of the things he had made. And behold, it was very good. This goodness reflects a moral attributes of it, but also has in it the idea of it being pleasing, of being delightful, of being joyful. In that sense, it is its full goodness. God looks, he aesthetically looks at his creation, and he values it for what it is, for its intrinsic value. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I tell my students this comes from Psalm 104, which is really a psalm of nature. It is a psalm reflecting upon God's interaction with the natural world. And I might add here, and this is reference to our next speaker, Tom, that in that sense, nature is God's craft work. It is his artwork. And in that sense, I would say that the falls is a grand piece of his art. And his joy and pleasure as an artist is reflected here. God cares for and provides for his creation. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy, or sometimes translated compassion, is over all that he has made, Psalm 145. The theme of this psalm is just this, God's compassion is care for everything that he has made. And I would ask this question, if God sees and cares, if he values what he's made, including the falls, then what value should we ourselves place on the riverway and on the falls? 
And then lastly, as part of this stewardship ethic, God tasks humans to care for and to protect his creation. As conservation biologist Fred Van Dyke, Van Dyke said, humanity's first environmental responsibility is to serve and protect the good creation. We are to be responsible stewards of God's creation, God's world. And, and that's why I, 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 I cite this idea of the Judeo-Christian environmental ethic. All right, so having um, reviewed some of these sources, some of these centers, some of these perspectives on value, how do we connect that to the notion of spirituality? Well, what I'd like to suggest, and I would like your help during the discussion, is from this foundation of values, we bridge to the topic of spirituality, particularly as it's been addressed by our speakers so far and, and in other ways, uh, in the following way. And I'm taking my cue from Philip uh, Sheldrake, who wrote about spirituality, as referring to the deepest values and meanings by which people seek to live. If that's the case, if we, if we connect spirituality here, I don't think it's a far reach, a far span from values to spirituality. So this is what I'd like to suggest here in, in, in finishing up. It might not be unreasonable to extend ourselves from values to spirituality in the following way. When we attribute value, or I would say worth-ship, worth-ship to the environment, to the creation, to the falls, how close are we then to engaging in worship of the source, the goal, I would say the creator? In that sense, how much of a transition is it from us attributing and finding worth in things like the falls to us then going to engage in worship, finding worth in the creation, leading us to worship of the creator. And lastly, what I'd like to do here, and this, this reflects a, a little bit upon Amelia's discussion about Lynch and his perspective on the falls. I'd like to close with a, some quotes from Richard Bauchmann, who's one, a very noted theologian of the environment, and see if, if he also helps us make this connection. So follow me here in a couple of quotes. All creatures exist for God's glory. And we most effectively learn to see other creatures in that way, as existing for God's glory, to glimpse, as it were, their value for God when we join them in their own glorification of God. I would suggest that's an act of worship. And then secondly, he says, this is the kind of appreciation of God's creation, valuing of God's creation, or as he says, sharing in God's appreciation of it, of his own creation, that can enable us to live rightly within it, that is within the creation, and to join with other creatures in living for the praise of God's glory. I would say that is worshiping him. So this is a way that I've tried, and I would hope in our discussion we engage further in this notion of how we move from valuing something like the falls to how we, we move to a position of worship, in this case, as a, as a spiritual practice. Let me end by acknowledging uh, some that have contributed to my thoughts and ideas on this. Certainly, Jamie and Paula and uh, the students that we've engaged with in our Discover Niagara project, Niagara project have been very important. My colleagues in the Department of Biology, Patricia Eckel, who has written quite a bit about the ecology of the falls, and then finally to Amelia for bringing us very desperate in terms of our, our disciplines together uh, to address this question. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight or today. Uh, I'd just like to thank the board for inviting me to be here. And um, when given the, the theme for today's presentation, spirituality, and, and just wrapping my head around that, it was really great to hear it from a few different perspectives from uh, history and poetry and writing and, and also science. And I'm here to talk a little bit about how it pertains to art and my working process and my life, essentially. Um, and so when I was first given this theme to talk about as an artist, first of all, it's hard to talk about your art. You know, if any of any artists out there, that in itself is a bit of a feat. And um, any layperson can also attest that it's hard to talk about your speech, spirituality 
in your life. But when you combine those two, it's actually quite hard, uh, especially in this day and age when um, the thought of intertwining art and, and your, your faith is, is really kind of frowned upon. Fortunately, now we're seeing a little bit more embracing of that, and, I, and it's really encouraging. So today I'll talk a little bit about that, and I'd love to start just by with a little quote by George Innes, one of my favorite artists. Um, and, and I never dreamed that I would actually have one of my works hanging beside an Innes in the, in the gallery here, so it's, it's quite an honor. Uh, he said, the true use of art is, first, to cultivate the artist's own spiritual nature. And I, I, th I definitely attribute a lot of my uh, working process and my thought process to kind of embodied within that quote. Uh, because I think, at least from my own perspective, in order for me to share my own vision or my own thoughts wh with my painting, I have to kind of delve deeper into that. And for me, it's through um, investigating my spiritual nature. And then hopefully I can share that with uh, the viewers and ultimately point away from me and hopefully upwards. And um, anyway, that's my endeavor. Uh, so before I get into talking and eventually talking about the, the actual painting that's hanging in the flanking gallery, um, maybe I just talk a little bit about my background, my spiritual journey, and, and how I've come to this point, and then I'll hone in on the painting itself and, and talk about some of the aspects of the working process as well as the, the symbolism uh, within that. So my spiritual journey, um, it, it goes way back. I, I consider myself a cradle Catholic. I, I grew up with it. I'm one of nine. I've got eight siblings, and um, fortunately, we're all very close. Um, so I had that seed instilled and planted in me very early and um, went through the, the typical early teens and, and 20s where you kind of question your faith. And I think that's an important part of, of the growth process. And, and through that, I found that my uh, art was always this grounding force through all that I was going through. Um, then in my mid-30s, I had an accident, and the accident involved um, a nasty cut to my arm from a chainsaw, and it was my drawing hand. And um, after getting through sort of the initial grieving process of that, for me, I took it as an opportunity to say, I'm going to somehow be better for this. And prior to the accident, all of my art education was through trial and error. And Prior to the accident, I was painting an average of maybe five paintings a year. After the accident, I actually bought a stack of books about this big on how to actually paint. And, and the process I was most interested in was the processes uh, explored in the Hudson River era, the mid-1800s. And I noticed that it really wasn't taught anymore. So I had actually get books that were over 100 years old to sort of explore how do you actually construct a painting. So I went from painting five paintings a year and then when I learned how to paint in the old methods, I'm now producing on the average of about 80 to 100 paintings a year. So as they say, with knowledge comes confidence and um, fluency, and, and even within the arts, that I think is very true. Um, I also um, had the opportunity to walk with my late wife through her illness. She struggled with cancer for a year, and that was an opportunity, again, where I learned a lot about myself and grew very close with my wife and also um, grew much closer to God. And, and it sounds odd, but I'm actually grateful for that journey. And um, as they say, we don't get out of this life alive. And to actually go through that process with someone that's close to you, um, it makes you a different person and you look at the world very differently. And I, I chose to celebrate that through my art and considered, continue to do that. So spirituality in nature, um, going back again, I have fished and hunted and camped all my life. That was um, growing up middle class with a family of nine. We weren't taking trips to Disney. Um, we were loading the station wagon with nine kids and covering the top, and we'd go camping. And that was a wonderful um, instilled aspect of my upbringing. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I worked in Alaska. I was actually a fly fishing guide for two summers. And that was... Uh, quite a, a life-changing experience when, when you're actually away from civilization for four months and you get your water from the mountain. There's no electricity, and there's no cars, there's no TVs. Um, that also is a wonderful opportunity to get introspective and, and just kind of seek yourself. And all the while, this was also informing me of 
the, the, the nature that I loved, and it was giving me this um, scientific, if you will, background that eventually I could use as a, uh, a voice. And then, of course, painting. I already sort of touched upon my history with painting. I should also note that I, I am self-taught, but it's through some reading, but really nature, for me at least, was my best educator. So a little bit on my process. I'll kind of run through this. I was told to keep this brief as well. Um, initially, I try to come up with a concept before I start working on the actual painting. Uh, once I have an idea of where I want to go with it, I start doing small sketches. They call them thumbnail sketches, and they're about two inches by three inches, roughly. And often I'll do, a, if I know I want to do a large painting, I'll do a small color study, and that's an opportunity for me to sort of figure out the color palette, the time of the day, the time of year, and there's no detail in that, but it really kind of gives me a, a little better vision. Then eventually that's transferred to the large canvas. Um, I, one thing I don't have in here is I, I often, at least in the case of Niagara, I spend a lot of time on site really getting to know the location. And, and for this case, I kind of like avoided Niagara Falls for many years. I think it's one of those things you, you live so close to it, number one, you take it for granted. And if you're like me and you love nature, you think tourism and you want to kind of be away from the crowds. Um, but when I kind of put that past me and I started approaching the, the falls from a more uh, open-minded standpoint, I noticed that when I'm close to the falls, everything else kind of fades away. I don't pay attention to the people that are there. I'm really imbued with that. And um, that's a huge part of the process for me is doing field sketches and field notes that I eventually bring back into the studio and use those as studies. Uh, the next step is called a grisaille on the large canvas. Grisaille is uh, just a term that means a gray painting, and that's really where you figure out the values. And then I do work in a layered process that actually goes way back to the Renaissance period where you do a series of layers. In the, in the studio, when I'm actually painting, a lot of times I, I've got classical music playing or different types of music, but I also put on podcasts or audiobooks, and it kind of also puts me in the mindset, especially if I'm working from a spiritual standpoint. Um, George Carlson, a Western painter and sculptor, wrote this. He says, I have a strong belief in the mystical qualities of life. I know it's unscientific and doesn't have a thing to do with logic, but there are a lot of things that escape explanation. Those are the realms where my artistic explorations take me. And I really connected with that. And when I'm in the studio, I think I'm hoping to get that mindset. Now, spirituality and the work, I, I definitely hearken back to historical painters. There's a couple wonderful books out there. One's called Painters of Faith, and the other one is called Knights of the Brush. And they really explore the spiritual nature of artists, specifically in the 1800s. The Hudson River School painters uh, really speak to me. After reading a lot of, uh, upon their work, a lot of times they use the landscape as a visual language upon which they would make statements, pointing ourselves to heaven, it's pointing our, our thoughts upwards. So every aspect from the time of the day, the time of the year, the, the use of different species of trees or the use of water, all had very specific scientific and spiritualistic and symbolistic meaning. Um, I was very fortunate to experience uh, a stay with the Hudson River Fellowship, which is a contemporary movement in the Catskill Mountains where a, a group of jurored artists would get together every year and basically just draw and paint outside every day for about four weeks. And for me, that was definitely my graduate degree. That's where I really learned about nature and I'm still learning. That's the wonderful part of that. Uh, again, I've already alluded to the fact that my purpose with my work is to share and to celebrate nature specifically. Uh, often before I begin my work, I start with a prayer and, and a, it's a form of dedication. And I find that my, my painting definitely seems to come within or from without in some ways where I feel that the spirit is painting through me. I often, or these days, always include with my titles verses from the Bible. And for me, that's a chance or an invitation for you as the viewer to look at the painting, read the verse, and sort of digest that, and hopefully find some kind of connection with that and consider that. And lastly, I've, I've said also, my, my work I really consider as a devotional prayer, and it's an opportunity for me and hopefully you to transcend. So specifically the painting that's hanging in there, which is Niagara, Psalms 8411, uh, that particular Psalm is, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory, and no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. 
So the symbolism, there's a lot of it that I consciously put within it. And in many ways, I hate to give you this play-by-play -play explanation because I think in some ways that may take away from someone's experience when looking at a work of art. But this is just a few of the things because there's a lot more. So, so first of all, the Vantage. The Vantage is actually what I would call neutral zone. It's more or less right in the center line of where the states and the uh, Canadian borderline would be. So it's kind of like this no man's land. And also the use of the, the light and dark of the shadow um, with the, the sunlit area. It's sort of this uh, intentional yin-yang of the dark and light we have within us. But also the time of day is sunrise. So it's sort of this hearkening to Christ and, and you know, this rising where light eventually takes over. The rainbow, we all know that the, it has biblical connotations to um, our covenant. The light flares, I intentionally, within the light flares, near the rainbow, put three, which is a hearkening to the Trinity. The turbulent waters have a connotation for all the tribulations we go through in life. The cascade is this falling nature, or the fallen nature of humans. The lower river below is this calmness and hopefully realization after all that we've been through. And the rising mist is a, a nod towards spirituality in our spirit. The cliffs, a symbolism of all of our, again, challenges in life. I intentionally put an isolated figure um, on the brink, and it wasn't supposed to be any specific person. It was supposed to be twofold. One is to give you a sort of a scale for the size of the falls, but also just to give you this idea of the, how our human uh, interaction with nature can be, which is very pure. And notice if you look at the whole painting, there are no structures in it. And that, that was very intentional. It actually took me a while to make that decision as to whether or not I would put the buildings in. And I decided to pull them out because I really wanted it to be about, well, about the, the whole environmental experience. There are birds within the mist. Again, another nod for the spirit, the Holy Spirit specifically. And in conclusion, I'd just like to uh, invite you to experience your own interpretation of not only my work, but also some of the other works that happen to be in that gallery now that are of the same vein. And consider a connection, once again, um, between God, Niagara Falls, and you. So, thank you so much. Uh, quickly, thank you to everyone. I mean, I was just, I was just entranced by everything uh, you had to say. Thank you for coming to this, everybody. Um, and I would just, uh, the university, I'd let you know, um, the university, the museum and the community, we are in the midst of a campaign um, to acquire Tom's masterwork, Psalms 8411, 8411, correct? And you can see it on display with the artist today. So if you, are, if you haven't seen it yet, please see it. And especially, you can ask us, uh, myself, Tom, Mary Helen, how you can get involved in this really special uh, campaign. Uh, so I know this audience, and I know that uh, they have comments and questions so uh, for any of our panelists i'll go to you i don't know if we need a mic i'll try though um and bring the mic to you and um, you can address one of our panelists directly or if not then one of us will take up your your questions So I believe it was a comment uh, from the audience that um, we didn't bring into consideration uh, the Big Bang Theory. We were talking more than, uh, along the lines of creationism, I guess. Is that, did I restate your comment correctly? Mm -hmm. 
some people think that it was uh, just a Big Bang, you know, theory. Have you heard of the Big Bang theory? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to avoid uh, that kind of argument. <laughs> I'll leave it to the scientists, but I mean, I think that we're all here because um, we we're seeking meaning, you know, oh, well, other than I that. It was about spirituality, you know. Well, that meaning and spirituality, if you want to uh -huh. address this. Yeah, I, I think what you're doing is, 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 again, drawing attention to this intersection between a scientific understanding of the world, of the universe, and then ultimately a spiritual understanding of, of it as well. Um, for the sake of time, I don't think we have time to go into all the meaning of the origin of the universe and, and how that relates to how God has told us about his creation, but I think I would at least comment to the fact that um, anyone that, that, that acknowledges the Big Bang, if you will, says there's a beginning, there's an origin, that the universe is not eternal. And I think that's significant to our understanding of, of, of the nature of reality. Uh, and so I would suggest from my perspective that that origin, however it came about, comes from originator, comes from creator. So going back to what I said, um, you know, we acknowledge that God is the creator of all things. How he did it is still a matter, obviously, for us to look and, and examine. Well, I, I, I think we, we, could, we, could, we could follow it further, but I would go to the first verse in Genesis and say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it's not told us how that happened. Is it consistent with all matter and all time and space coming out of a singularity? I don't see any problem with that, um, but that again is my attempt to bring our scientific understanding with how we understand Genesis 1.1. That helps, but I would love to, to carry on this conversation going further. But I don't know if for the sake of the talk, yeah. it, we'll, the we'll move on. But yeah, you yeah. still, you still, the no, job no, is, is open yeah. as a theologian, Bill. <laughs> Any other questions, comments for our artist? Yes, sir. Our mobile mic. Yeah, I Yes. <laughs> um, right now we're in a hiatus, let's put it that way. We're not, we're not doing this project this fall, but we've done it for the past three or four falls with our students. And we'd be happy to tell you more about what's involved in that. So the short answer is it's, it's, it's on hold for the, for the moment. I can't speak for our other panelists, but I would say yes. I think this is something the university, I'll, I'll, I'll let Jamie maybe speak more to this. The university at, at even the highest levels is very interested in having this as a way of, in, in an interdisciplinary way, looking at Niagara Falls, understanding its meaning, and ultimately engaging in Niagara Falls, both the cataract itself as well as the community. So Jamie, maybe you would want to develop this further, or Paula, I, I don't know what to well, I guess I would just say I would be very interested in um, opportunities. I think we've all talked about different ways of kind of bringing this to the community. So I think mm -hmm. we'd be open to um, maybe different venues um, to share, you know, or even, so we do take students to the falls and we set up different stations. So Dr. Cliff does things like measuring trees, which <laughs> I never get to do, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and um, I have students journal at the falls, um, Dr. Cott. Um, 
discusses some of what she talked about today with um, perspectives of the falls and, and um, Hawthorne. We've had a history professor talk about kind of the history of tourism. Um, and students, um, you know, wander to, to each of our locations um, down at the falls. So I think, you know, I, I, ideally, um, it'd be great to kind of take that to me to the community and offer some kind of um, smaller tours or discussions or something along that, those lines. I'm just not sure how to kind of facilitate that. Yeah, maybe that's so a discussion. If anyone has any ideas, yeah, we'd, we'd be open to hearing. Yeah, we could have later on because I think we would be interested in knowing about community partners that might be interested in learning more about what we've done and then perhaps even being part or a partner in doing that in the community. So, I, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I definitely think this is an ongoing thing. And um, as it moves on, these discussions, this is something that we would always have the community in, in mind, an open invitation. Another question? The question is asking to comment the distinction between um, Hawthorne's visit to the falls, which was quite reverent, if he's characterizing it correctly, uh, Dr. Cott, as opposed to when Oscar Wilde came, how many years later, how many years in between their visits, um, at least 50, 50 60 years. Um, and um, Jamie, uh, Jamie Carr knows a little bit about this too, when Oscar Wilde, another famous literary figure that visited the falls. Um, so. Sorry, I would just say um, I don't see them as different. <laughs> um, so they both came in search of fame, uh, which I write about in the book. Um, and the falls is their way of becoming famous, even though it sort of didn't happen immediately for, for each of them. But um, so I, I think Wilde's irreverence. Um, so one of Wilde's very well-known quotes, which Mr. Gallagher knows well, is, um, and I'll probably mess it up, <laughs> um, every American bride is taken there, and it's the, one, one of the earliest, if not the keenest, disappointments in American married life. Um, so he had this real irreverence, when, but, but, he, he, but he sort of made these flippant comments f for the media, right? Because he, um, he came to make a name for himself, and, um, Hawthorne did the same. He wasn't Hawthorne, the Hawthorne that we know when he came in 1832. So um, he had this idea that he would um, write these travel narratives of uh, this, you know, growing nation, and um, and that would be sort of where he got a start. So I think, to my mind, they're not all that different. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. that you should be congratulated because you stretched my thinking about the gorge, the river, and so on, since I spent some time fishing and so on out on the river. Secondly, I do have a question, though. In any perspective, from any point of view of all the panelists, how do you think it's going in America concerning how society values the environment in a general sense? or in very special, unique places like the Niagara Gorge, however you want to take it. How are we doing? That's a large question. I don't know who would, <laughs> I don't know if we can answer in the couple minutes that we have here, but um, if anybody wants to offer their perspective, Paula, you, you well, grab the mic. Well, I would say that um, this, uh, the debate that Lumley captures between this utilitarian view of the falls um, and this uh, spiritual view continues. 
Um, I'm thinking about all of the debates that go on about uh, the creation of national parks or even the delisting of national parks um, or uh, you know, s spaces out west. So it, it's, it's controversial. And um, so I think Americans have a sense that there's something about our landscape that needs to be protected. But um, you know, at, at the same time, other, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, the business of America is business. And uh, it's as if these two forces continue to be at, at odds with one another. So uh, I, as I was talking about the delisting of, of parks, I saw many people shaking their head. And I, you know, I think we're well aware of um, how this controversy continues. Thank you. Yeah, my, my comment would be what has happened, what the, what the trends have influenced our value of the environment. And I would say one thing that, that, that scholars have looked at is, is the urbanization of America and the fact that people do not experience the wild, the outdoors, as much as they might have in, in past times. And I think the argument could be made that my regular experience of nature, of God's creation, lends toward an appreciation of it and lends toward a greater value. And if I don't have that experience, then my level of value goes down. So I would say on the positive side, I mean, that's happened, I would say, in the United States. Uh, uh, and there's concern about that. But on the other side, there are a number of programs and initiatives to expose children, adults, mm -hmm. to the outdoors, to the, to the nature, to, the, to God's creation. And that, on the other hand, heightens their value for it. So, where we're going with this, I, I, I can't say, but I know there are trends, and I would say I support the trends that say, get us out into the gorge, to the falls, often, regularly, hiking, fishing, and so on. That, I think, is something that will help us to better appreciate it and therefore value it. Thank you. And um, we'll end the formal questioning here, but please stay uh, to talk to the panelists, have some coffee. Thank you so much for for coming this this um, getting into evening Monday evening thank you